Hello, I am Dr. Lauren Apter Barron's father, director of the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh. The Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh connects the horrors of the Holocaust and anti-Semitism with injustices of today. Through education, the Holocaust Center empowers individuals to build a more civil and humane society. In April 2020, we launched a month of programs for genocide awareness in partnership with the organization Together We Remember. The first event was held April 5th, 2020. Originally envisioned as an in-person gathering at the August Wilson African American Cultural Center in downtown Pittsburgh, it became a virtual gathering, which featured a panel of experts on the Holocaust, genocide, atrocity prevention, and trauma-informed community building. We left the panel discussion committed to reconnecting with each of the panelists. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the series of follow-up conversations, where we will ask the questions we received during the Q&A on April 5th. We will learn more about each of our panelists, and we will continue to explore the question, what does never again mean to you? I invite you to continue the conversation on Facebook during and after each broadcast. Thank you for joining us today. Together, we can turn memory into action. Good afternoon, everybody. Hello, thank you for joining us. Um, we are here with Susan Bro. Susan Bro is the mother of Heather Heyer and co-founder of the Heather Heyer Foundation. As the president and board chair, she works alongside co-founder and executive director, Alfred Wilson. Prior to the arrival of COVID-19, Susan traveled around the country, speaking on behalf of the Heather Heyer Foundation, sharing Heather's legacy of nonviolent activism and social justice. Susan believes she can continue to bring about positive social change through the education and training of the next generation of activists, advocates, and allies. Today, I am pleased to share the microphone today with Together We Remember founder and CEO, David Estrin, who kindly introduced me to Susan months ago as we crafted plans for our summit in Pittsburgh in person in April. Obviously, that did not happen, but I am thrilled that we are able to do this today. So welcome, Susan and David. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank welcome you. to my sewing room slash office. <laughs> Good to be back together again. It's uh, deja vu. It is. It, it is great to, I, I mean, I'm finding that Zoom feels like being with people and I welcome it and I'm just grateful that we can be here today together. Um, I wanted to start off. So we did an event on April 5th and we got a lot of very good questions. Um, that unfortunately we did not have time to take uh, during that program. So um, one of them, Susan, I want to invite you to reflect on this question, which is um, from one of the participants on April 5th who wrote, I've never understood bigotry in any form. It makes me physically ill. How and why did this us versus them mentality originate? Now it asks about the origins of that, which could go back thousands and thousands of years, but if you could reflect on that question of us versus them mentality, what it does to us. Well, yeah, I was gonna quote Disney here and or at least Angela Lansbury's version of it and say it's a tale as old as time. But um, I, I think it's born out of fear and anxiety, which um, it's, it's from the fear of I have something you have something, I need more, I'm afraid you're kind of coming after my something, and I'm afraid I need your something, so let's put a wall between us, let's separate ourselves. And the problem with that is at some point, you push past the point of seeing the other person's humanity, and you come to a place where you dehumanize them. So you are either willing to do them great physical or emotional harm or both, um, or you have convinced yourself that they're going to do the same to you, therefore you must defend yourself. And it set us, sets us up for a whole series of misunderstandings and real dangers to people because we have dehumanized them. We no longer see them as, as people. 
So I understand that your daughter, Heather Heyer, was really devoted to social justice and to um, nonviolent activism. Can you tell us a little bit about her and about how she has inspired you? Um, Heather was not known in the community as an activist. That's one misunderstanding people have. Um, her form of activism was in one-on-one -on -one work or in um, battling uh, prejudice and misunderstanding on social media. And she would engage people in conversation to try to change their mind or change their heart. And she would do it through presenting facts, uh, facts about how people were treated, sharing news links, uh, sharing statistics. Uh, she taught me a lot about going with that rather than trying to go with a gut reaction. In fact, I now have a policy. If I get a strong gut reaction, I need to go check it out. And I'm trying to get other people in the habit of doing that. If you feel a strong emotional reaction to a story, go see if it's true. It might be, but it might not be. Uh, just go find out. It won't take but a few seconds to find out, and then you'll know how to respond. But we. Um, have to be willing to hear one another. Um, even on the day she was killed, Heather um, went up to one of the neo-Nazi girls as they were packing up their cars to leave and she was trying to have a conversation with her. Well, tell me, why are you here? Why do you feel the way you feel? Can you talk to me about your beliefs? And she would do it in sort of a cajoling way. I've seen her do it with family members. She's done it with me. Um, and she would listen to what you had to say and agree with what was true, but refute what was not true with facts. And for me, that's been a tremendous approach. Um, I try to encourage people to, to adopt the same method because people are more willing to accept the possibility that us and them are actually one and the same on some level, if you take the time to acknowledge uh, one another's value. This seems to be such a complicated, it's always complicated. Even more so, I feel like in this era of COVID, where we're seeing disparate health outcomes in certain communities, we're seeing scapegoating of minority populations. Um, this is something that, I mean, we're always working against this kind of thinking at the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh. And now I feel like it's more important than ever that we're talking about these things because they, they are affecting people in a very concrete way, even more than um, what we saw in Pittsburgh with the shooting at the Tree of Life. That risk is all around us. What happened in Charlottesville with the Unite the Right rally, that risk is all around us. So that's where I'm, please. Please. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think most of us um, who are white tend not to see it because it doesn't affect our daily lives so much. But I know that communities of color are very much aware of this mindset. They deal with it constantly. And in our place of privilege, with our heads buried in the sand, so often we don't see it. Now, being Jewish, you will have more of that. Uh, Arab Americans also have more of that. Um, the problems have always existed. They're just coming out in the open more. I do want to add a note here that while your young people are doing their schooling and so many other activities online, you cannot abdicate your responsibility as a parent to know what they're seeing, what they're hearing, what they're doing. Um, Many times white supremacist groups will try to radicalize young people by starting out with a joking approach, the Peppy the Frog, the little silly jokes, the racial innuendos in the form of a joke. And the kids don't get the difference, but they do become desensitized. And it's up to you as a parent to have conversation about what they're seeing, have conversation about what they're doing, um, I know it's tiresome. I know you're exhausted at the end of the day, but you don't get to abdicate your responsibility. You only have them for a few years and then they're gone. So um, it's very important that you take the time to talk to them 
about what these things might mean, how they might hurt somebody, how they can offend somebody, or, um, you know, acknowledge things that are good that they're seeing as well. But it's time for family conversation about values, particularly when you have this unique situation where you're all bottled up in the house together. Uh, you're not gonna get a time like this again. <laughs> Hopefully, I mean, it may go on for a little while, but um, it's extremely important that you take the time to see what your kids are seeing and, and um, look for the deeper ramifications and explain to them and discuss with them what they may be missing and maybe um, be becoming radicalized and not even aware of it. So this connects with one of the questions that we got, which is the opposite side of this, which is the um, power of young people. So um, we had a question from one of our partners with Echoes and Reflections, which is a Holocaust education organization we work with often. Um, she wrote, where some people see apathetic or digitally consumed me generation, excuse me one second, I see young people galvanized for a more just and equitable world. What are your thoughts on youth action? Well, of course, the Heather Heyer Foundation was set up to support youth activism. Um, when our scholarship scoring committee are handed applications, they're given a redacted copy, which has all pronouns, all uh, indications mm -hmm. of religion, um, all um, gender references, race references redacted. They're strictly looking to see whether or not this person is an activist for a positive um, um, nonviolent social solutions or uh, whether they um, have the grades play a small part of it, but a very small part. And primarily we're looking to see is the person an activist because I do believe young people are naturally activists. They don't have the uh, as many inhibitions as adults. Um, and I know some of them are, do have some shyness and anxiety. I'm not saying they don't, but um, they don't have all the obligations that people have. They don't have a mortgage yet. They don't have kids uh, in school to think about. Um, so many times uh, youth movements have changed the world. And, you know, even if we look back to the civil rights movement 50 years ago, we see that the, the black youth so often led the movement because they had the freedom to do so. Um, so I do strongly believe in, in the power of youth and the, and the energy and the drive. I'm 63, going to be 64 later this year, and I tire out. You know, I can't go the long haul sometimes. Um, I can't go out every evening and do things. I, I, I have other things that are, you know, to do and stuff. Um, so I do very strongly believe in the power of positive youth activism. We started a program, uh, we're trying to figure out how to best redo it now with schools changing, uh, called Higher Voices, that youth actually asked us to start, saying they wanted a program where they could develop their own social justice campaigns without the adults taking over. The adults could assist and they could offer advice, but they couldn't take over. So um, we have been trying to find ways to handle that that do not put us in a position of liability because we don't have control over their programs and yet still encourage positive um, programs. So uh, I very much believe that youth are capable. Um, they're just not always encouraged. They're not always sure what to do and um, I think general nudges can provide that for them. It's a perfect opportunity to bring David Estrin into this conversation. Um, as you are aware, Susan, David is hot off the heels of a 24 hour global vigil and with us an alert. Um, part of what Together We Remember is doing is a very active um, youth action network across the United States and um, David, I just want to bring you in to um, reflect a little bit on, on your feelings in conversation with Susan about empowering youth, not only the nudge, but really opening the door to the youth role in the work that we do. Sure. Thanks, Lauren. Um, 
I would say that it's pretty clear at this point, not just from historical cases, but our work of late, that young people are not just ready to learn from history, but they're ready to make history. Um, all they need is the chance to do so. And in the past month, we had a call with about 60 young people all across the United States who joined and formed our Youth Action Network. We didn't have one until, you know, 30 or so days ago when the young people said, we want this. And so we got out of the way and we supported, as sort of Susan was saying, providing some helpful nudges, um, setting up the infrastructure and the, the norms for collaboration, meeting weekly. And out of that emerged what, about 10 different collaborative projects, most of them social media based. Um, and they are projects that all of the young people want to keep doing. So now I'm supposed to hop on a call later this evening for, you know, what's next? Uh, we didn't plan for that. It's just, it's just we're, we're you know, simpler to Susan and, and, and higher voices. It's the exact same thing. We, would, young, we, the young people, would like a space to collaborate with, you know, uh, adults providing helpful support, but at the same time, letting us run the show. Um, and as long as you're rooted in really strong values and young people are ready for those values, they embrace them and values like inclusion, um, local relevance, um, letting young people truly lead and um, providing the support to make that happen, then they're, they're ready to rock and roll. And, and the, the best, uh, you know, one of the best pieces of advice I got from an educator, Nick Haberman, who you know very well, is that young people are ready to be the players in the field and educators can very much be the coaches on the sidelines, um, but supporting them each step of the way. So whether it's Susan, myself, or you, Lauren, I think that's a really helpful role that we can play as well as others in the Holocaust and genocide education, human rights um, realm. It's, it's, a, it's an exciting time to be a young person uh, to, uh, to really make a difference. I think, Susan, you're right about um, young people not having as many inhibitions. As I get older, right, I'm in that weird zone of like, I think I'm young, <laughs> but am I? I'm 29, like, what, what am I now? Um, young. <laughs> every year that goes by, I get more anxieties and inhibitions and responsibilities, uh, which make me less likely to jump into the crazier stuff. But young people, they're just you know, my most creative years were those years where I just didn't have, I, I hadn't really failed necessarily. So you got to take advantage of that. Um, and, and they'll learn, they'll have their experiences. So those are my two cents on youth engagement and, and the role that we can play to support young people to, to help us move forward. Let me throw in too, Please. I, I didn't even run the Higher Voices program because I was on the road all the time. Um, uh, Jamil Wilson, who was our intern over the summer and Elliot Cisneros of the SUM actually put the program together and then Elliot ran the program for the fall because I was on the road constantly. So I don't want to give a false impression that I did anything <laughs> except show up for the first meeting and the last meeting and that's all I got to do. Well, that's also part of the story is sharing the work. You know, and yeah. sometimes, sometimes it just takes the person to set the stage and then back off a little bit and let the magic happen, which is a lot of what we have seen over the last month of programming. That there, I mean, there are so many people around the world that can communicate now, even in this very strange time, we have an opportunity to be even more connected. And this is one of the questions that came in on April 5th was a question about um, not only the dangers of this moment during a pandemic, but the opportunities. So I wonder, Susan, if you can reflect a little bit on that. Well, one of the biggest dangers is this kind of pandemic um, economic crisis feeds people's anxieties, honestly. Um, this is a classic case of uh, like the legend about the Indian young man and his grandfather where he says um, that whichever wolf you feed is the one that will grow. So we can feed our anxieties or we can feed our um, confidence in one another, our reaching out to one another for help. So as more people are using Zoom <laughs> and other forms of contact, I mean, I actually got to spend FaceTime with grandchildren and my parents and I have had long conversations that we have not been able to have for a long time. We might get a half an hour on a Sunday and that would be all we've had. Instead, now I have the opportunity to connect more closely with family and friends. And I have the opportunity to um, do some research, some reflecting, uh, cleaning, clearing out, which is also good for the soul. And, um, 
you know, you, you can make positives or negatives out of this. It's all in which way you choose to go with it. Um, so um, I'm trying to make choices to make this a positive, but I will tell you there are times the anxiety overwhelms me or when I'm unpacking Heather's things, which you see a lot of behind me on the shelf here. Uh, I've sat and sobbed for a half an hour or so, and then I'm like, okay, this is just part of the cycle of life. Move on with yourself. And um, you just have to be careful not to give in to your anxieties, give in to your fears, give in to um, the terror of the moment. Um, we'll get through this somehow. We'll get through this together. We can get through this stronger, but we can't give up on our connections. We have to strengthen them. One thing that is really striking to me, Susan, about you and, and what you've done over the last few years and connected to what has happened in Pittsburgh um, since the attack on the Tree of Life building um, is your resilience, your incredible resilience that um, you came through that experience and you came back so motivated and such a powerful voice for justice. How? How do you find that strength? Where does that come from? Um, well, a couple of things. I'm, I'm from a very long line of strong people. Um, I, I think Appalachian mountain people have had to be strong to survive a lot. But um, my initial goal in speaking at all was just to make sure the truth was told about Heather because the um, white supremacists were spreading so many lies and um, faking so much film footage and stuff. So my initial goal was to tell the truth, but also to fill in the gap where I saw an opportunity. I was handed a platform that I didn't ask for, didn't really deserve. And I thought, okay, what's the responsible thing to do here? Um, so I have been using that platform to point out inequities, using that platform to speak up for justice, but also to uh, largely what I talk about when I talk is to explain to people how they should step up, why they should step up. And I tell them, here's why Heather was important and here's why she was not important. And um, trying to stick to the truth. But um, the, the, the fact is, death is a part of living on this earth. Pain is a cost of love. And um, we don't get to pick who dies or when they die or how they die. Everyone around us is going to die unless we die first. And that's just part of the cycle of life. I don't know what happens after death. I don't need to know right now. I just know that it happens. And um, it does cause pain for those who are left behind. But like as I said, that's the cost of loving someone is that you risk that, that pain. So um, my philosophy is suck it up, buttercup, and move ahead. And if you need to cry, cry for a minute, cry for half an hour, cry for a day. But know that you don't have to stay in that place of grieving. You can get up and pick yourself up and move on. I have found for me and for many others that when you do something um, in the memory of or in the honor of the memory of the one that you have lost, it does help to ease the pain. It helps to take your mind off yourself and put your mind on others and how can I be of service. Um, I strongly believe in a life of service, of serving others, of taking care of others, and um, that's a family value that goes back many generations in my family. We don't always get it right. Please don't misunderstand me. And Heather was not a saint. I'm not a saint um, by any means. Don't even pretend that. Um, but, but we do have obligations as human beings and, and life involves some of the things I've been through. I wonder if you could elaborate just for a second about something you said when you're talking to groups about Heather and you talk about why she was important and why not, what, what does that mean? Can you elaborate? Well, Heather, um, Heather's death brought focus to an event that really was ripping off a bandage 
on our society uh, where many of us like to believe that um, everybody believed and thought a certain way and yet we knew there were haters there we knew they sort of lurked in the background we knew that they were on the rise but a lot of us pretended that we were not affected by that um, and honestly a lot of people were unaffected by charlottesville there's still many people out there who either never knew about it or have forgotten about it um, but Charlottesville was a ripping off of a bandage of uh, a genteel society that didn't really have any problems. It's a liberal white town uh, that actually has a rather significant black population, but as many uh, towns, and I won't just say Southern towns because I've seen it in Cleveland and a lot of other places where there are um, significant black populations that are largely unacknowledged, largely um, ignored. Um, simply watching the TV can tell you a lot. Look how many black people are on the channels. Look how many black people are on the news. Look how many black people show up on the television. Um, and um, so in that way, Heather's death was significant. It was a call to action for many. I heard from millions around the world um, who said that when she died, it was a moment for them of realization that we must all step up. But what I say about Heather not being important is Heather was a normal person doing a normal thing, agreeing to walk with her friends just to show solidarity. And that's really all she did that day was going to walk. She was dressed to go to her afternoon bartending job her bartending apron was in the car she had her hair pulled back in the braid she had on her black uh, t-shirt and and uh, slacks that she would wear to work in the bar and she really fully intended to go on about her life after the walk she didn't go there planning to be a martyr she went there knowing that she could be but didn't really think she was going to be particularly at the point where everybody had left and they were going up onto the mall to celebrate that this was over and that the Nazis had been kicked out. And um, so in that way, she's not important because what she did was doable by anybody. All anybody has to do is stand up, stand up to be counted. You don't have to um, do a grand gesture. You don't have to lead a large movement. You don't have to be well known, you don't have to be famous, you don't have to have a large Twitter following. You just got to stand up and do the right thing. You're not responsible for the consequences of how that goes. You're just responsible to show up and step up. So you were a teacher and we work with many, many teachers. I know that you taught elementary aged students um, we work more with sixth grade and up, but we're always hearing from people who are who want us to work with younger and younger ages. But um, well, what you were just saying about the power of an individual, um, the ability to do something without it being something heroic, um, what would you tell young people, really young people, not like the teenagers that we worked with that together we remember, but like the seven and eight year olds? I think one of the simplest rules that you can explain to kids is the golden rule, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Um, and you don't have to put it in that wet language. That's just the way I learned it. Um, but that really can shape um, a child's perception. If you teach them from an early age to treat others the way they would like to be treated, and you yourself model that, that's the key. Because you can tell them one thing, but if you're not doing it yourself, they're gonna do what you do. It's, it's definitely do what I do, not what I say, no matter <laughs> how we wish as parents it would happen, kids are gonna do what we do. So if they see that you're treating people respectfully, if they see that you recognize the humanity of other people, if they see that you call out, um, injustice and, and inequity, they're going to do it too. 
Um, it's not to say that's the only thing that's going to happen because sometimes when we do all those things, kids will rebel. But um, you do your best as a parent to try. Also, sometimes kids see you being so horrible that they will do the opposite and become a just person. <laughs> um, kids are humans and they will make choices. But as a parent, if you can teach the golden rule and live it yourself, that's, that's a big, big start. And that needs to be a discussion woven in as you read stories, woven in as you read books, woven in as you're even looking at commercials, as you're doing all kinds of things. It's, it's easy to take a quick moment Look for the teachable moment, as they call it. My dad and my mom were the truly masters of that. And um, throw in the odd remark that's meaningful and then move on. Don't, you know, don't beat the point to the ground. So I know that David and Together We Remember did some work with you in Charlottesville. And I'm going to invite David to sort of ask you a couple questions about that. Sure. Thank you, Lauren. Mm. So Susan, my question is, um, what made you say yes to working with us? You know, I'm sure, especially during that time, you know, within a year of what happened in Charlottesville, um, it's a very sensitive time and you were meeting lots of folks, but what about how we approach the work? Um, did you feel willing to take a chance on us collaborating in Charlottesville? Um, and also, what has inspired you to keep collaborating with us, which obviously has led to this conversation and you know, so many really special things that we have since collaborated on. I'm just, I think it's important for folks to hear how, um, you know, how this unfolded both, you know, without, uh, you know, a little bit of luck, but also a little bit of um, a lot of intention as well. And I'm curious from your perspective, how that sort of played out. Um, so you and I met at a Nexus conference when I had spoken about uh, the very fledgling Heather Heyer Foundation, I was meeting a lot of people at the time. And a lot of people would say to me, oh, I wanna work on this with you, okay. And you know, we would exchange business cards and then I would wait to see who got back to me. Um, but my number one priority in agreeing to work with any group is what are, the, what are their core values? Do they, look for equity for all or only for a few? Do they um, speak to solutions or do they just simply wring their hands? And I saw in Together We Remember not only some optimism, but you also talk about genocide and atrocities around the world. Um, the Holocaust is bad enough, but you point out the fact that this was not an isolated incident. This is a humankind problem, not simply something that Germany had a problem with, but that it's a worldwide problem and it, it affects many people around the world. And so I was drawn by that and your um, sense of optimism and enthusiasm is also quite contagious, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. That means um, the world to me uh, and I have learned so, so much from you in, you know, the year or so plus that we've come to, to know each other. Um, I, I quote you often, um, <laughs> and, uh, oh dear. But, it, but it's, but it's seriously important. And, and I know, you know, you've inherited wisdom and we all inherit wisdom in different ways, but, um, you know, I, I really do believe that our movement is beginning to bring the best minds together. Our goal is to build like this Marvel superhero team of folks of, uh, who who have witnessed or experienced some of the greatest loss, but have turned that into the most change possible. And slowly but surely, we are doing that. And uh, we wouldn't be where we are without without your wisdom, your support, and without your invitation to do some of that difficult work in in Charlottesville. And one of the most profound insights that I learned from our first project was. Um, you don't always need to be doing the work in the limelight for it to make a huge difference. For example, the fact that our very first Together We Remember vigil in Charlotte, uh, Charlottesville was uh, behind the scenes with community leaders and really no one ever has known about it. But it has led to, you know, a lot of positive conversations uh, locally, but also beyond 
Um, I think that's another important insight that I'd love for folks who are listening and tuning in to know is that not every event needs to be a public kumbaya sort of thing. A lot of individual yep. conversations go into it. You and I met, you know, a dozen times and have since met a dozen times and text and call and just there's so much work that needs to go into a successful bridge building community event. And the last thing that I want to share that another insight that I learned from you and, and others is and it comes from Heather's wisdom, which is asking why people believe what they believe from the beginning rather than coming at a um, accusatory sort of you're wrong, because that's not going to serve anyone. But if we understand how someone came to believe what they believe, we have a much better ability to counter that, you know, tactically, but also to understand um, and to figure out, you know, what were the potholes in that person's life for us to that we need to now go back and try to fill um to, to 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 mend our ways so just a couple of insights that i've learned from you over the years and heather indirectly uh which i'm so so grateful for well thank you um i think sometimes too when we hear someone else's story we can catch things that we ourselves have potholes and blind spots in as well um it's not always one-sided um I, I want to talk a moment about education. Um, one of the questions someone asked was about sharing some of the operational, um, what is the terminology here? Operationalize the uh, never again, again. yeah, um, parts of, of um, Oh, help me out, Lauren. I can't get the words out. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, so it, so we did have one question about the Never Again Act that went through the House of Representatives. And it, so the question was, how can you help to operationalize those recommendations? Right, so this ties in with me being a teacher. I think that very strongly we need to familiarize ourselves with the bill. We need to be in touch with our state senators and um, representatives. We need to reach out to our local school boards and offer to help. But I also want people to think of this as part of an overall revamping that needs to be done because there's been a damping down of truth for hundreds of years in our educational system we don't tell the truth about what we did with native americans we don't tell the truth about what we did with black history we don't talk about how jews have been treated in this country and it's not that we need to only focus on um how people you know when we have like black history month it's a it's a one month shot and i'm not saying we need to now have a holocaust month where it's a one month shot i think that all of this truth telling needs to be woven into the regular fabric of history lessons and it needs to include the successes of people in those communities as well as the hardships that people have been put through and the trauma and the prejudice and the um barriers and the consequences of those traumas and barriers for all the people along the way. We have such a diluted, falsified history um, mentality at this point, it's gonna take major revamping. Unfortunately, a lot of our educational policies are formed by lobbies reaching out to um, departments and reaching out to um, education boards and so a lot of what teachers get stuck teaching is minutia for the test taking and it's not an overall picture it's not a clear um, understanding if we could try to try to find a balance between the test taking that's needed to demonstrate we're doing good teaching and developing the critical thinking and the um, clear understanding of why things happen. I think that that's a major challenge. Now, I walked away from teaching in 2010 because I was quite sick. Um, I'm, I'm not good at doing um, 
uh, moderated approaches to anything. I pour myself into something so intensely that I kill myself in the process and then have to back off. And I had done that with teaching um, to the point where I was, didn't feel I was doing an effective job anymore. So it was best for me to leave the profession. I understand teachers have a very difficult time and teachers are not to blame. The, if there's blame to be had, it's on higher decision makers so, succumbing to lobbyists. Somehow we have to find a way to get to um, truth telling in history and putting it in perspective, age appropriate, of course. Um, we don't need nine-year-olds necessarily hearing about lynching, but there are, are ways to explain history. There are appropriate methods. I know that this can be done. Um, in the interim, I made a handy dandy high tech sign that shows <laughs> how people can find some good information. And you can also, for black history, substitute Jewish history or Asian history, any kind. You know, there, the internet provides us with endless resources, go to the internet, look at several sources, get some information about books that you can read, um, obtain those books through any number of digital resources or whatever, and read them together as families, have those family value conversations, have those meaningful talks about, well, how does that make you feel? How would you feel if you were them? Um, is this something we would want to do as a family? Is this the way we would want to be treated as a family? You know, here's where you can have the conversations. Um, teachers don't really have the time to do that in the classroom as fully as they would like to. And this is your chance to insert your family values because that's not the job of the teacher. The teacher should not be um, responsible for transmitting your family values to your child. <laughs> So we were talking about the Never Again Act, just getting back to that. And I'm gonna ask you a follow-up question. And then after that, we'll take questions from anyone who is participating today. So get those questions coming. We have a bit more time with Susan Bro today. So I understand that there's an act um, that you presented, the Heather Heyer No Hate Act. Can you tell us about that? Well, it's the Khalid Jabara Heather Heyer No Hate Act. And what happened was the Arab American Institute was doing some research and discovered that Khalid Jabara's highly publicized murder on August 12, 2016, exactly one year before Heather was killed, um, very well known case, tried as a hate crime, but not listed in the FBI statistics as a hate crime. So um, they thought, well, what other cases are there out here that are highly publicized? So they looked up Heather Heyer's murder. It was not at that time uh, reported to the FBI as a hate crime either, although it was tried as a hate crime. So the Khalid Jabara Heather Heyer No Hate Act is an act that um, strengthens the ability of lo local uh, police departments and sheriff's departments to um, report hate crimes to the FBI. It provides training, it provides some resources, uh, because I said when I spoke to the members of the House Committee on it, you've got to provide money if you're going to provide this. You cannot offer another unmandated, um, I'm sorry, unfunded mandate because states are already flooded with these. If you're going to provide a mandate, give some money for it. Um, so uh, that, I don't know where it is in the process right now because we've all been so struck by the pandemic. Um, I'm, I'm encouraged that the Never Again Act went through. I'm, I need to get back in touch with, with uh, my representatives in Congress and see where we are with the uh, Khalid Jabara Heather Hire No Hate Act. Um, it was a bicameral, uh, both houses, and uh, had nonpartisan support at one point. I don't know if that's still true or not. Um, but it's simply to fix the loopholes in hate crime reporting. 
I say that when you take your car to the mechanic or take your child to the doctor, either one, the first thing they do is they look at the symptoms. If you don't have an accurate representation of what's happening with hate crimes in this country, then you simply cannot prescribe uh, good medicine, good mechanics for them. You need to know what's going on, have specific information that you know is factual and um, that's a first step in fixing the problems. That really resonates with me, I have to say, because we're, we're in a city that experienced the worst anti-Semitic attack in the history of this country. And yet we know that things are happening all the time that are not reported. Right. And we know and, that if we want to get at the scope and extent of the problem, we don't have the resources we need to know what we're dealing with. No, so, and that happens for a lot of reason. It can be because people don't want to, um, that they're afraid that, and rightfully so sometimes that they won't be believed, but it can also be for localities. It can affect things like educational funding through real estate costs and all sorts of things. There's definitely a lot that plays into whether or not you get at the truth, but this um, legislation does provide some help with some of that. Well, thank you for doing that. And we have questions coming in. So I'm, gonna, I'm glad, keep asking them, keep asking them. We'll see how many we can get to. Okay, the first one to come in, what is one of your favorite resources for family value conversations? Oh gosh, we have to remember my kids are in their thirties. My son is almost 40 now. <laughs> so, um, I mean, we would have looked at movies. And talked about them. This was back in the day when you were in, and you rented this big suitcase of a VCR and a stack of tapes and we would have movies weekend and there would be conversation around those movies. So that's obviously changed for families but you you know if you're streaming something if you're um, I don't I don't know it it's it's more of a mindset as a parent to look for the teachable moment. I know I had some of the most intense conversations with my children while I'm driving down the road and both hands are on the wheel and they would bring up something so intense and personal, it would take my breath away and I thought, okay, don't react, just answer. <laughs> you know, because I'd be like, oh my God, I can't believe you're asking me that now. Um, but if you're mentally prepared for the teachable moment, you'll find it. Um, they come up at the strangest times, just uh, spend time with your kid, have fun, have some quality fun time where they feel like they can come to you and talk to you about things. Okay, so the next one is unrelated, but a very good question. How is your foundation addressing misogyny and anti-LGBTQ bigotry? Um, we're not specifically. I will tell you that um, what we are addressing as a foundation is supporting the education and empowerment. The foundation is working to um, provide scholarships for those kids who are activists. Many of them are activists in um, LGBTQ initiatives, but our focus is not on those issues specifically. Now, I will tell you, at a session of Higher Voices, the girls were all complaining. Uh, it was primarily girls who enrolled. I don't know why, if, if it's just because Heather was a girl, so they think we do girl things, or we had one guy who enrolled. But the girls kept complaining how the boys at the Model UN had done this, and the boys at the Model UN had done that. And I said, all right, ladies, I became um, a, um, feminist in first grade when they told me I couldn't climb trees and, and had to wear dresses to school all the time and I stomped my foot and said that's not fair. Uh, I think the issue was that it was snowing and we still had to wear dresses and boys got to wear pants of course. Um, and, I, and so I talked to the women then about how you stand up for yourself. You don't have to always smile. Um, and we talk, you know, I will talk one-on-one, -on -one, but as an organization, that's not our focus. I, I do strongly believe in dealing with those one-on-one -on -one when they come up, but yeah, that's not been our focus. 
So we got another question that is really on point for some of the things we've talked about today. Um, it reads, hi, I am a Michigan resident and I am seeing so many similarities between what is happening at our capital and what happened in Charlottesville. I'm wondering if Susan has any insight based on retrospect as to how we can circumvent a tragic outcome here in Michigan or perhaps even facilitate a positive and productive result. Part of what the problem, and actually, <laughs> I just learned today from friends who were on the front lines in Charlottesville, as I never was, um, that part of the reason it looks so similar is that some of the same people. Um, the three percenters were here that day, as well as they're the lead protesters in Michigan. Um, and they're not even from Virginia or Michigan. Um, I think the biggest problem that we had in Charlottesville was that authorities at state, national, and local level were led to believe that white supremacist movements were not dangerous. I hope that now people take that a little more seriously, but that's been a federal policy for many years and only within the last year has that uh, focus been allowed to change. Um, so I'm hoping that we will not see the same tragic outcomes in Michigan because the State Department takes it a little more seriously. Um, that was not taken seriously. The local um, activists were telling everybody who would listen and even those who wouldn't listen that this was serious, that, that it was to be taken seriously, that it was to be believed, but because the federal authorities and the state authorities were saying it was not the local authorities made the choice to do what the step state and federal authorities were telling them, which was nothing. Um, so hopefully Michigan is, is going to take it more seriously because hopefully the feds and the, and the uh, others are taking it more seriously. And I jump in, Lauren, as well, with just a little bit of wisdom that I got from Susan, it turns out, um, <laughs> which was, you know, that the goal of many of these groups is silence or violence. And we cannot be silent, nor can we be violent. So what happens in, in the place of that? And, you know, it, that is further complicated by the fact that we cannot um, gather in person in the same ways as we might before, right? So after Charlottesville, I believe there was a gathering, uh, a white nationalist gathering in Boston. And what you saw was a handful of white nationalists gather together and I think 25,000 Bostonians. And that visual from a helicopter of like the city, including the mayor behind that, um, was a very powerful example that hate would not be accepted in Boston. Um, and, you know, the folks that were leading that rally, you know, first off, their turnout was a lot lower and they did not win the story. So I think it's a big communications challenge. How do we win the story? How do we win the narrative, especially when the media, you know, right now you've got several hundred people that are driving a news cycle um, through their protests, but there's so many more of us who are have very different values. How do we communicate that? How do we do that virtually now? I don't have all the answers to that hardly. However, what we did during April, especially in our 24 hour global virtual vigil, I think should warrant far more coverage uh, than, it, than it typically gets. So we have to find ways to get the positive story to be communicated. That way the oxygen is not going towards the more negative narratives that the white nationalists um, are fueled by um, because that's what they then retweet. They say, look what we got, you know, who to tweet or who to say, um, or look at our person. You know, when we document what they're doing with the Nazi swastika and the flags, that's what, that's their goal, right? Um, so we have to come up with alternatives. And I think, you know, young people and, and some of us on this call, we're smart enough to come up with those alternatives and we have to keep fighting um, on that front. We certainly have more power if we, uh, if we team up more uh, intentionally. And again, credit where credit is due. I got that from Christian Piccolini. <laughs> Perfect. Love it. Nice. All right. Well, we're going to run out of time in a minute, and there are a couple of things that I want us to accomplish before that happens. So um, we are asking during these follow-up conversations for you to reflect again on the idea of never again and, and what that means to you. We have to come together as human beings. We have to find a way to get past the us versus them. We have to pull together. Uh, I don't think this 
pandemic crisis is over for some time yet. So we have to rethink how we connect with one another, how we support one another financially, fiscally, emotionally, resource wise. Um, this is actually a chance to make a better world for everyone. So let's think about how we want to do that in a way that will satisfy everyone. Uh, we're not going to get it perfect. We're not going to. We're not going to create utopia by any means. We're not going to put our arms around each other and sing kumbaya. But can we find a way to exist side by side? That's the question. We have a great opportunity to do that now. There is no reason for us to go back to another genocide to solve this. It never solves anything. It doesn't, it, it does the opposite. So let's make a commitment. Let's develop a mindset that says never again as a country will we let ourselves be so divided as we are right now. And let's find a way to move past this. Is there anything else that you want to tell us that I didn't ask you? I have advice for people and I just did it. Um, always tell the truth. Always be accountable for your actions and always think before you speak on matters of importance and the bigger your platform, the bigger your responsibility to do those things because your words have consequences. Don't underestimate the value of your word. Your words have consequences, so don't throw them around carelessly, especially not in front of your children, especially not them. I have one more question for you. Yes. And this came from our audience. What do you want us to remember the most about Heather? That you simply need to step up and step out, put feet to your intentions. It's great to say, I want to make a difference. It's great to say, I don't know what I can do, but you know what, when the opportunity comes for you to stand up and do the right thing, don't say, Oh gee, I'm worried they might be offended. Oh gee, I'm worried that I'm going to upset somebody's apple cart. Do the right thing. It, it, it can be a little scary if you're not in the habit of it, but believe me, it becomes, it becomes easier with practice. Stand up, step up, step out. Susan, I can't thank you enough for coming back to sit down and talk to us today. Um, you have so much wisdom to share and you inspire me very much. And I'm sure that other people who are watching and will watch this recording long after we conclude um, we'll learn quite a lot from what you've shared with us. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you, David, for being part of this conversation and for bringing Susan um, into the world of the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh. I wish we could have done it in person, Susan, but sometime soon, I hope. I hope so. I'm looking forward to it. Indeed. It's just the beginning. Yes. Um, <laughs> we have so much work to do. And um, with partners like you, I know that we have a, a strong chance of success, even against the odds that we face. We can do this. Thank you. Thank you so much.